Philippians chapter number 1. I'm going to read a few verses this morning. <clears throat> Verse number 21. The Bible says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. For I am a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Now, the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Philippi, okay, we all know, this church was started out of that house of the Philippian jailer when Paul and Silas, like we heard about on Wednesday night, started saying it just, hey, could be worse. Right? We're here because Jesus loves us. And then they got a little touch of the Holy Ghost, started singing them after they got done praying. Right? Then earthquake happened. God sent by their way. Philippian jailer, as a result, ends up getting saved, takes them back to his house that night, says he and his whole house believed okay so his whole family got in now we don't know back then you know once the mother and father got up to a certain age the children would have them live with I don't know how many people is in that house right and under their customs at the time sometimes whole families would live together they just add another room to the side of the house and then that's where that family lived right we don't know how many it started off with but we know that there's a church that he wrote a letter to a couple of years later. And in these verses, we find something. We find a conflict, really, is what we find in the Apostle Paul. He says, verse number 21, For me to live is Christ. That's a great thing. He says, But for me to die is gain. Why? Because he gains Christ. He gains the other half well, more than half. We just got the earnest of our salvation with the Holy Ghost. But he gains everything that Jesus came to give him when he died. But he says, but to live is Christ. He goes on to say, if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet, what I shall choose, I would, he says, to be honest with you, I don't know what to choose. To stay here or to go on with Jesus. He understands the importance of staying, but he also understands the joy of going. Okay, then, verse number 23, he says, For I am in a straight betwixt two. What's that mean? He's in a fork in the road. He's caught between these two opinions, as he told King Agrippa. He says, both of them are good, but to be honest, if I had to choose in my flesh, I don't know what I'd choose. He says, because having a desire to depart. Why? Because the one that he finds altogether lovely is waiting on the other side. His desire to be reunited with those that maybe had already fallen to the martyr's sword. His desire to be reunited with the one that originally he persecuted but met him on the road to Damascus. The one that he said, Lord, what would you have me do? Right? He desires to depart. That word desire means to long for. To want earnestly. This isn't just one of those things where, you know, at some point in my life, I'd like to go see the Grand Canyon. That's not a desire. That's a whim. The desire is something that ch causes you to change the way you're living to get to that thing that you desire. He says, I desire to depart. If we're all honest today, there's a part of your soul that desires to go home. There's a part of you that knows we're pilgrims and strangers here. But there's a place where we belong, not because we're anything special, but because he robed us in his righteousness. One of these days we're going to get married in the family. We've already been birthed into the family. We received the adoption of sonship. He did everything to make us welcome in that land. And we know that when Stephen, they were stoning him, he looked up and he saw the son standing, ready to receive him. We know we desire to go because we know that we'll be welcomed not by Peter at the gate. Right? We're not going to be welcomed by angels. No, we'll be received by the one that loved us enough to die for us. 
We'll be made welcome. We'll be shown our home by the one who paid the price for us to get there. But, so he desires to go. But he says, and to be with Christ, which is far better. If we're being honest today, but it be a whole lot better to be in heaven today. Amen. If we compare the two, staying here or going, going's a whole lot better. Amen. You say, well, what about this? What about that? It's all in God's hands anyway. If today's the day that I'm going, it's better for me to go. Amen. If he causes me to stay here the rest of the day and for decades to come, who knows? But it's always better to be where he's at. Right? Well, he says, nevertheless, verse number 24, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. The Apostle Paul says, the conflict is that if I go, I know that there's things that God's given to me that I still need to give to you. He says, the reason I can't go is because God's not done with me yet. The only thing that keeps us from heaven is that God has something for you to do. He says, I desire to go home. To be with the one that loved me with their everlasting love. To be with the one that I've suffered all the shame, all the reproach, all the pain and the punishment. He's literally a prisoner at this point. Go back and read. He says, hey, me being a prisoner has actually been profitable. He says, I've been to, able to enter into palaces and talk about Jesus. He says, when you talk to the king, there's a big crowd around listening. When you talk to those that are in power, there's always an audience. He says, the things that we think are inconvenient, he says, it's profitable. But he says, for me to stay, as much as I want to go, and if we're all honest, we want to go. But he's saying, I couldn't go with a clear conscience knowing that there's still stuff that I need to do for you. The Apostle Paul staying wasn't profitable for him. Jesus could have raised up another preacher. You say, well, God wouldn't have done that. Don't say what God can and can't do. What God won't and will not do. God's going to do whatever God wants to. But the Apostle Paul understood that as long as he was here, it's because it wasn't for his profit, it was for other people's profit. What did the Apostle Paul have to gain by staying? He's already a joint heir to the king. Everything that Christ owns, you own. If you've been washed in the blood. What can we gain by staying here? It's not for me. It's for his cause and it's for others. That's why in verse number 20 he says, but for me to live is Christ. He's not living for Paul or Saul, who he used to be. Now everything that he does isn't for his profit. It's for the glory, for the exalting of the name of Jesus Christ. And it's for others. Again, verse he says, which is needful. Not just needful. He says, it's more needful for you that I stay than that Jesus take me on the glory. We'll get back to that here in a second. Verse number 25, he says, And having this confidence, in other words, he says, I'm sure of it. I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. He says, God's told me I'm not going home as long as my being here is for your furtherance. That's your growth. That's your maturity. That's your development. He says, Literally, he's still got a few chapters of the Bible to write to him in this letter. He's literally talking about, he's still got things for me to tell you. But then he would send preachers by their way. I mean, that's what Timothy, Titus, Timothy was a bishop, he was a pastor, but he also, at the Apostle Paul's request, or at God's leading, would go to other places and preach. Just like our pastor's not here today, he's still the pastor. But God took him somewhere else. Why? Because... God wanted him to preach down there today. Same thing with these preachers that the Apostle Paul mentored. They say, and they're going to come to me. I'm going to preach to them what Jesus preached to me. And they're going to come and preach it to you. That's called the perpetuity of the gospel. You know why you have your Bible? Because it's the perpetuity of the gospel. 
You know how the doctrine of Christ continued before the Bible was completed? Perpetuity of the gospel. That, that which was delivered by Christ is still preached today. But the Apostle Paul says, for me to stay, even if the whole Bible's around, which it wouldn't be by the time that the Apostle, because John hadn't written the book of Revelation by the time Paul died. But he's saying, every day that I'm here, it's for your furtherance. He's not trying to make them feel guilty. He's not saying, I'm in these bonds today because it's for your good. No, he's saying it's his joy to be used of God while he's here. Remember, he said he was betwixt the two. That means he had as much of a desire to stay as he did to go. Because if he had more of a desire in one direction, he wouldn't have been caught between two. He'd have a stronger desire to do this. He says they're equal. Because I know by staying, it improves your relationship with God. It's for your furtherance of your spirituality. He says, and by your spirituality getting you know, furthered along, he says, I know you'll go out and you'll win others. And when others are one, guess what they're going to teach them? What the Apostle Paul taught them. He says, it's just as important that you have a complete understanding in your faith as it is for me to go on to glory. He says, it's just as important that I preach to you what God's delivered unto me as it is for me to go on home. Be with them forevermore. Verse number 25. He says, for your furtherance and joy of faith. He says, you already got faith. But he says, as you further your spirituality, guess what happens? You start having more joy in what you've received in that faith. He says, me staying here is not going to get you any more saved, Brother Phil. You're not going to be more saved because you heard a message that somebody preached one day. Once you saved, you saved. No degrees. But as you grow in your spirituality, you begin to have more joy in the salvation that you have received. You understand it more. You understand more what God had to do in order to save you. And as a result of it, you take more joy in the fact that what we just sang about, we didn't deserve it. But yet, it's just like Jesus to do it. Right, verse number 20, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. In other words, the Apostle Paul understood that those that love is appearing, there's a crown of righteousness laid up for him. He understood that what Christ taught, that wood, hay, and stubble would be burned up in the fire of God's judgment, but gold, silver, and precious gems that we lay up in heaven, those one day will be given to us as our reward for our labors in the Lord. But notice he said, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ. The rejoicing aspect is when the Lord says, here's those things that you've laid up in heaven, we get to have ourselves a hallelujah fit that we've never had before when we lay them back down at his feet and say, no, Lord, we did this because we loved you. I firmly believe that one of the greatest moments of is when we see what we did for the Lord and we get to give it right back to him and say, no, we did, did this because I loved you. This was never mine to begin with. This is all yours. I know I'm a joint heir, but you're still the heir. It's yours. But he says that your rejoicing in Jesus Christ would be more abundant. Did he not promise to give us life and life more abundantly? Well, guess how he wants you to rejoice in your new life? Abundantly. You know how you rejoice more? You got to know what God's done in order to rejoice in it. When we got saved, we's happy that God did something. We's just happy that we weren't going to hell. We knew that that burden that was on our shoulders had been rolled away. That there was a peace that we had never had before. That there was just something bubbling up inside of us we really didn't know. Come to find out that's joy, that's love, that's peace, that's long suffering, gentleness, meekness. It's that new creature that he started. We're just bouncing off the walls. Right? Well, why does 
that faith, because we, the world keeps hitting us, and to our detriment, we get over the fact. We forget what it was to have the burden of sin on us. All we know now is the burden of everyday life. But he says that your rejoicing may be abundant. You realize that you can get into this book. You can go back and listen to any of the messages that our pastor preached on the wall back there or on YouTube. And you know what every message and what every page does? It points us back to him and we can rejoice in what he's done for us. Amen. Right. Abundant rejoicing, he says. What's that? Rejoicing that you can't continue. It just keeps going. If something's abundant, you can't quench it. It means it's everywhere. I mean, not going to be too long. Sorry to any of y'all that have grass. But uh, these things called dandelions are going to pop up here in a little bit. And guess what? If you don't do something about them real early on, they're going to be abundant. And if they're abundant in your yard, guess what? It's going to be abundant in your neighbor's yard here in a few weeks. And then guess what? It's going to spread throughout the whole block. But everybody knows where it started. Right? It was that one house that had all the dandelions. Right? What are we saying? It's the same way with your rejoicing and your joy in Christ. It may start off with a little, but guess what? If you let that thing blow, let the wind, which we heard Wednesday night, picture of the Holy Ghost. Right? If you let the wind take your rejoicing, take your joy, and just let it spread it out throughout your life, guess what? you're going to find that eventually there's a whole lot of rejoicing there's a whole lot of joy you know why most people don't have it because they don't want to be seen as the oddball so they go out and they spray it with raid or whatever weed x they need right no i'll just rejoice inwardly the word rejoicing means that it gets outward there's some sort of outward expression of what's going on inside Right? You can't rejoice quietly. You may be quiet, but them tears rolling down your face speak words a whole lot better than you could say. Right? The most reserved... I think Miss Gloria all the time. Right? Every now and then, those of you that didn't know Miss Gloria, back there on that Trophies of God's Grace banner, she'd just get to where she couldn't take it no more, and she'd hop up, raise her hand, and go, whoop, sit right back down. Right, she's, she's real reserved. I mean, she'd tell you from sun up to sundown what Jesus did for her and how appreciative she was. But during church, she just wanted to be a part. But every now and then, she just she couldn't take it no more. Right? But before that, you could look back there, and guess what? There's tears rolling down. Her face. There's a big old grin spread across her face. Right? I'm not saying how you rejoice. I'm just saying that if you're rejoicing, people are going to know. You got dandelions in your yard, people know. They don't need to knock and come up to your door and say, excuse me, is that a dandelion growing over there? They know it's a dandelion. Guess what? When it turns white and it's not yellow no more, they know that dandelion's getting ready to spread. They don't need to come up and ask you. You think you're going to do some more rejoicing tomorrow? No, they just know. It may not happen the next day, but eventually another yellow dandelion's coming up. If you let joy and rejoicing this is nowhere in the notes but you're welcome joy and rejoicing just run rampant in your life you know what happens it spreads that's what it does can't contain it why would you want to but joy and rejoicing just brings more joy and rejoicing not just in you God may take one of them seeds blow it across the street and guess what it ends up in somebody's yard over here because you were just happy for what Jesus did for you, somebody else may realize how happy they are for what Jesus did for them. It's infectious. But the Apostle Paul said that because he stayed, he said, God's leaving me here that your rejoicing may be more abundant. His rejoicing wasn't going to get any more. I believe the Apostle Paul knew a little bit about rejoicing. Well, how do you know that? Because God liked his rejoicing and his prayer so much we sent an earthquake one night. Right? God 
delights. Right? He inhabits the praise of his people. Right? But I think the Apostle Paul knew a little bit about praising, a little bit about joy. I believe that he was he wasn't perfect, but I believe we can say without a doubt he was a mature Christian. There we even compare him to Job. When God called Job a perfect man, it meant that his faith wasn't lacking anything. He was an upright man who feared God and eschewed evil. You know what I see in the Apostle Paul? An upright man who feared God and eschewed evil. I believe that his faith was lacking nothing. Was he perfect? No, he said that there was days that he did the thing that he didn't want to do, and then there were days he wouldn't do the thing that he desired to do. He called himself the chiefest of sinners before he got saved. He understood who he was, but he also understood what Jesus did in him. What not for the Apostle Paul's furthering that he has left here? It was for the benefit of others. For the cause of Christ. So all that being said, this morning we're going to teach on right, the life of the new creature. The purpose of the new creature. Nowhere in here do you see where after the Apostle Paul got saved that he lived for his own benefit. Here at the tail end of his life, right, he's not on the chopping block yet, but he's pretty close. He's taking his tour from region to region, appealing his cause, till eventually he finds his way to Caesar. Even once he got there, he went before Caesar, I believe at least two times, to present his case. But what are you saying? He's not in the heyday of his ministry where he's going from town to town preaching up a storm. He's in bonds. Now think about it. How much could one person that was in prison really do for the cause? Well, he did a whole lot. That's when God slowed his life down enough that he was able to pin down the things that God had burned into his heart. Able to send them off to those that needed to hear it. And guess what? They understood the importance of it and they preserved it. Till eventually all of them were put into one book. And then eventually one day it's translated into English. And that's why we got what we got. Right? There was much that he still had to do. He understood that his journey wasn't over. But he also understood that his journey wasn't for him. It was for two reasons. Go back, verse number 21. For me to live is Christ. The life of the new creature, the purpose of your new life as a new creature, is that when he told Nicodemus, he being Jesus, that ye must be born again, you know what that means? You got a new life. That's why he called you a new creature. Right? Because what we used to live for, that's dead. Wood, hang, and stubble. Right? He said, take no thought for tomorrow. He said, having food and raiment to be content therewith. He said that he would take care of all of our needs. Why? So that we wouldn't have to worry about the things we used to worry about. That we could be concerned with this. For me to be alive today is to live for Christ. That's the purpose of the new creature. Is to live for Christ. I'm not living no more. It's Christ living in me. Any day that I get up and do what I want to do, rather than saying, Lord, if it be your will, I'd like to do this today. I rebel against that new creature that he made in me. I quench the Holy Ghost when I do what I want instead of what he wants. Because guess what? I'm not living anymore. I'm reverting back to the dead man. What was Adam and Eve, what did they do in the garden? They asserted their will over the will of God. They wanted that fruit, even though God said, the fruit of that tree will kill you. Ye shall surely die. But why? Because they wanted to be as gods, knowing the difference between good and evil. Lowercase g. Guess what? They died spiritually. You know what the Apostle Paul figured out? The only way to keep from dying spiritually, from having to get into, I mean, even if you're alive spiritually, we're still going to fail them. Right, this flesh is still going to sin. Nothing we can do can ever get away from First John. 
Right? If we confess, we still going to have to confess so that He can forgive. Right? But there's a difference between growing and dying. You can make mistakes while growing and learn from the mistakes and grow even more. But by saying, well, I know what I'm supposed to do and I'm going to do it on my terms, you're dying spiritually. The Apostle Paul didn't say, okay, God, I'll go preach to Nero, but I'm going to take a weekend trip and do it then. Instead of spending a couple of years in shackles, going everywhere from beating to beating and town to town, getting put on a boat that was in a storm so bad that you couldn't see the sun, stars, or moon for two weeks. Right? I've seen some storms, never seen one that bad. I've seen it rain pretty hard, but guess what? You can always see that the sun came up. I've never been in one so bad that you couldn't see the sun. And through all of it, they're being tossed in... All the, who, that thing was probably doing flips out there in the water. Why? Because guys that sailed their entire lives were scared to death. They threw food, shat, you know, all the tackling, sails, anything that weighed more than what the boat was, they threw it out into the ocean, trying to stay up on top of the water. But I'm sure the Apostle Paul wouldn't have picked that way to get to Rome. But what? Why did he do it that way? Because that's the way God wanted it to be done. You realize if he wasn't shipwrecked, he wouldn't have gone to an island with a whole bunch of barbarians where they were just putting logs on the fire and somehow a snake came out of the fire. I don't know how a snake can be alive in the middle of the fire, but it came out the fire and bit him and he didn't die. And because of that, the barbarian said, there's something special about that guy. Right, just like when they came and saw the madman and Gadaret clothed it in his right mind, they said, first they thought the only one that has power over the devils must be the devil. So they thought that that's who Jesus was, and he said, no, nah, well, they ran him off. He said, hey, stay and tell him who I am. Guess what? Next time he's in town, whole city came out. Right from all around, they came to see Jesus because then they understood who he was. Even then, the madman to get there, what did he want to do? He wanted to go with Jesus. But Jesus said, no, 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 you stay. I know you do. What was it? He was caught between two. He received a commandment. He wanted to go, but he also knew that God wanted him to stay. Just like the Apostle Paul. Did he get to do what he wanted to do? No, he wanted to go with Jesus. But yet he did it. We don't know the ridicule or the, you know, the uh, adversity that he faced. What are you talking about? You used to be crazy. Right? Weren't you the guy that used to gnaw on himself and break chains off there? Why would I want what you've got? This is just a phase. He'll go back to doing it. Because for a while they said that they would chain him up and then he'd have one of his fits. He'd seem normal for a little bit. Everybody's just watching and say, today's going to be the day that he snaps. Watch it. I bet you if we just annoy him long enough, make him angry enough, that he'll snap and then we'll have to go chain him up in the graveyard again. I'm sure it wasn't the way that he wanted to do it. But why did he suffer it to be so? Because for him to live was Christ. It's not about what happens to me. It's what happens for the cause of Christ. I desire to go. You know why I desire to go? Because I don't like this thing. This thing called the flesh. I don't love this place called the world. And to be honest, if me being able to be used of God, if it irks the flesh, good. Why? Because it irks me every day. It's not about what I feel. It's not about what I endure. Why? Because it's all for Christ. So what if I have to go through something? But truly, you know what I've got laid up for me on the other side? Everything. The Bible says by Him and through Him all things consist. You know what that means? He owns everything and He runs everything. So when I'm a joint heir with him, guess what I get when I get over there? Everything. And I don't have to do nothing with it. Because I'd mess it up. 
You know what I get to do for all of eternity? I get to worship the one without the restraints and the, you know, all the, the flesh. I get to worship him how he truly deserves to be worshipped. One of these days, I'm going to get to sing a new song that no, nobody's ever sung. Right? How are we going to learn it? Because Jesus already knows it. We'll have a body like his. There's your answer. Take that, theologians. But what's for me to live is Christ. I thought we loved him. I thought we had appreciation and joy for what he did for us. So who cares how he tells us to do it? Who cares where we got to go? Yeah, a bad day is a bad day, but I'd rather have a bad day with Jesus than me put my will above his and having a bad day without his guidance. Because the worst day that I can have with him is far better than the best day I can have without him. Because I may get everything I want, but guess what? There's still a hole because it can only be filled by him. It wears off because he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He don't run out. But guess what runs out? The desires of the flesh. Those change all the time. Right? The lust of the world. You know, brand new Corvette's only going to last you until the next model comes out and you like that one more. What are you saying? For me to live is Christ. It's not... For me to live is not Jordan. It's not about what I'd like to see happen with the rest of my life. No, no, no. For me to live is Christ. Now, because he loves us, he's going to take care of us. Right? He cares about you more than you understand what it is to care about anything. He said that you are in his hand and his hand's in the Father's hand. That means it's got to go through God twice before it happens to you. He cares for you. He told you to cast all your cares upon him because that's how much he cares for you. He's not going to let something happen to you for no reason. But here we see in this verse of the Apostle Paul's submission, his humility, saying, for me to live, it's Christ. I do it his way, for his causes, for his reasons. Because it's not about me. It's about him. But then the second purpose for the new creature, again, if I'm doing what God wants me to do, the way God wants me to do it, when God wants me to do it, the second will happen. You can't get the second without the first. But the reason that you're still here, as we've already said, is because God wants you to make an impact in somebody else. The purpose of the new creature is to live as Christ. Right? To let Christ live in you for this purpose. Okay, go again. Down to verse number 23. Or 24, sorry. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Truly, what do I have to gain while being there? Well, I may be able to accrue more riches to lay down at his feet, but surely those aren't mine. Those are his. He's the one doing all the work. I'm just the one that's obedient enough to go and do what he tells me to do. I'm not the one saving anybody. I'm not the one that's convicting anybody. I'm not the one that's pulling on people's heartstrings and telling them to get up and go do something for somebody else because the Lord knows that that person needs it. Even if I'm the one that goes and does the thing, I'm not the one that knew the need, and I'm not the one that gave myself the ability to provide for the need. Well, I gave money to that cause. Who put the money in your bank account? Who gave you the job so that you'd be in a position to be able to be graceful and merciful to others? Who gave you the ability and the heart to care for other people? It's all part of the new creature. You say, well, Jordan, I can't get up and sing. I can't get up and teach. I'm not able to go out on visitation because of a physical debility. I mean, do you realize that the people that make the most difference are those that, as the book of Proverbs says, a word fitly spoken, a card in the mail, a timely phone call, or even without them knowing, you getting in the prayer closet, grabbing a hold of the horns of the altar and lifting their name up before God. 
You know what all of those things have in common? Your flesh doesn't want to do them. But you want to know what they also have in common? Those are because Christ lives in you. Let's be honest. I love y'all this morning. But if I'm losing sleep over something, this is me we're talking about. I hibernate. Right? I don't nap. I don't go to sleep. I don't lay down for a few hours. When I'm out, I'm out. Okay? If I'm losing sleep over something, it's because God got me up out of bed to do it. I mean, we could spend from sun up to sundown praying for everybody in this room, but unless God puts the burden on your heart, it's not going to amount to nothing. He said to avoid vain babblings. Right? The Bible says that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. That means God's praying for you. God doesn't need me to pray for you. Jesus is praying to the Father for you. But He honors the faithfulness and the obedience of when the Lord lays somebody on your heart. Lord, I don't know why. Don't need to know why. Don't know how you're going to do because I don't know what they need. But Lord, I know you put this person on my heart and until you take the burden off of my heart, I'm going to pray for them. Because I know you are able to do for them far exceeding above what I can do for them. And if you want to use me to do something for them, that's fantastic, Lord. But if not, just do something for them. All of that flies in the face of the mentality and the goals of the flesh. That the flesh does something, the flesh wants to be noticed, wants to get pat on the back. If the flesh does something, it does it loud so that other people can see. But yet if the Lord inspires you to do something, you don't want to bring attention to yourself because you're afraid it might embarrass the other person. You don't want to put somebody else's need out there for others. You want to be able to do it discreetly. Why? Because I don't want the glory. I want God to get the glory for it. Right, but let's go a little bit further. He said for him to live was for their profit. He said, because if I keep living with Christ in me, guess what? Other people are going to get the reward. Jesus is just that way. You spread seed, it's going to grow somewhere. He promised his word would never return void. Right? Your love, your compassion, your tenderness to others, guess what all of that comes... Here's, here's what the, uh, the feel-good people don't tell you. You can be good to other people, but it's going to cost you something. To give of your time, of your effort, of your just presence, guess what that takes away from? Something that you would have done otherwise. In order for you to be used of God, you've got to sacrifice part of the flesh. It may be what the flesh wants to do. It may be what the flesh wants to watch. Maybe what the flesh wants to read. It may be that you just have to sacrifice a little bit of your pride or your humility. But the Apostle Paul knew that if he stayed, his life with Christ living in him would be a life of suffering. Did not Jesus promise that the world would hate us because they hated him? I mean, we can. It's in this verse. I mean, in this chapter. That he goes on to say that it's a privilege for the Apostle Paul to suffer for the name of Christ. You know why it's a privilege? Because I'm suffering because I'm doing something that's against my carnal nature, that's against this sin cursed flesh and against the world. And as a result. I get to do something that the world doesn't want to do, can't do, has no ability to imitate, and that show the light of God to somebody. Maybe through a handshake with a track in it. Maybe through a phone call. Maybe by taking somebody out to dinner. But you know what's going to happen long before you ever get to... The Apostle Paul always loved preaching. He always loved sharing the gospel with somebody. But you know what he had to go through a lot of times in order to get to that experience? Suffering. 
You know what you're going to encounter in your life if you live and to live is Christ? There's going to be a lot of suffering getting to the point where God can't use you. You said, but, but Jordan, that's not fair. Why isn't it? He suffered more than anybody could ever imagine suffering as he hung on the cross. But we don't suffer because God doesn't love us. We don't suffer because the world is out to get us. You know what our suffering is a result of? You're trying to nail the flesh to that cross that he told you to take up and follow him. And that's painful. You know why? Because it's still a part of you. But yet you got to nail that sucker down and take it with you. He said, take up your cross and follow him. He doesn't want me to die on the cross. No, for me to live is Christ. But guess what has to die on that cross behind me? The flesh. And I'm stuck with it, so I can't hang it on a cross on a hill somewhere. Now I got to take it with me, but it's going to be nailed to the cross behind me. That involves suffering. Why? Because I have to kill a part of myself that I'm not wanting to associate with. I want the new creature. My man can only serve two masters. He'll love one and hate the other. I hate it. I want to nail it to the cross. That's suffering. Going against everything that in your natural mind says go out and uh, heap to yourself, right, great riches, or heap to yourself a, a large family. They say if you've got a large family, you're blessed. That's true. But a large family don't make you closer to God. That the logic of the world and everything that's ingrained in your carnal mind, right, the old man, it says go out and gain. But yet the life for Christ is one that says, Lord, I want to give as much as I can. That's an inward struggle that you're going to have to suffer with. Even if the world leaves you alone, they're still suffering. But if you start doing something for Jesus, they're going to try and heap on, add more fuel to the fire. There is suffering because I'm in a world that I'm not a part of anymore. But for me to live is Christ. It's not my suffering. Everything he does, it overshadows everything that I go through. He didn't say for me to live is suffering. No, he said it's Christ. But in order to do something for the cause of Christ, there's going to be a little bit of suffering. It may be a knock on the head every now and then when we get too big for our britches and God has to humble us. Maybe shame. Because when we mess up, we can't get over it. Now, there's a lot of ways that you can suffer, but you know what I promised? He said that he'd be with me. Friend that's taking it closer than a brother. The one that he said, take my yoke upon Guess what that means? He's in the other side of the yoke. He's there every step of the way. Why? Because for me to live is Christ, and I can't do that without Christ. The more I suffer, the more I get closer to him. Because when I get away from him, guess what I'll stop doing? What he wants, and then there'll be no more suffering here but we'll pay the price for it and suffer there for the judgment seat of Christ so what's the purpose of the new it's not about me forget me forget you our purpose the life of a new creature it's Christ and I want to do what Christ wants I long to be with him as much as I want to go I want to stay because as long as I know I'm here guess what He's getting the glory. It's for other people's benefit. The Apostle Paul said, Lord, let me suffer so others can rejoice abundantly so that they can have more joy in their salvation. He said, Lord, you suffered so that others could have, and I understand that in order for me to live and Christ to live in me, I will suffer, but the joy is that he will take our faithfulness and our effort and turn it into benefit for others. I've already reaped a whole lot better than I've done. Again, what am I going to gain by staying here? No, 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 I got it all. Whether or not I can receive it all right now, that's a different story. But guess what he gives to me? Press down, shaking and bubbling over. Handfuls on purpose. You say, well, I've had a hard week. Was it harder than being lost in your sin? Do you remember that? 
Because the Apostle Paul did. Right. And he said, for me to live is Christ. I'm winning every day. And he says, because of my suffering, I get to go places that I wouldn't have gone to without it. And guess what happens? More people get help there. Right. If my suffering gets me closer to him and closer to where he wants me to be, bring it on is what he said. But that's the purpose of the new creature. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.